Rise and shine, history buffs. It's time for another episode of Monday Morning General. Here we give you the play-by-play and analysis on battles from antiquity to the 20th century. I'm Brendan, hanging out with Bjorn. Today, we start a series on the fall of Constantinople. So Constantinople was founded in 330 AD by Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. It was a jewel of the ancient world. It had a strategic location in the crossroads of Europe and Asia, which made it a coveted prize for ambitious powers. As the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople flourished with its wealth, culture, and awe-inspiring architecture. Yeah, so Constantinople originally created by the the Western, you know, you had the Western Roman Empire, you had the Eastern yep. Roman Empire. 330 AD is kind of when we see the Roman Empire is so large that someone has this great idea. They say, hey, uh, too big for one man to handle. Let's cut it in half. And then throughout the next couple hundred years, the Romans are going to have this, you know, they're going to go back and forth between having one yep. guy trying to rule them all. And then they would have partners. And obviously the partners didn't get along. Eventually, what's going to happen is the Western Roman Empire is going to is going to fall and we're going to be left with just the Eastern Roman Empire, which ch- takes on the name of the Byzantine Empire. And so that's kind of where we're looking at here moving forward for the next about a thousand years of its existence. Uh, Constantinople will be a part of the Byzantine Empire or part of Byzantium, which is what it was previously. Uh, the city has had a couple of different names throughout history. And it has a currently different name than one would, which we'll be talking about today. So the city, part of Europe, on the on the edge there, the Bosphorus. You've got the going into the Black Sea. For those who don't know, it's right on the right on the edge between between Europe and the Middle East. Turkey's there, uh, currently in charge of it. But then you've got Greece and Bulgaria, kind of on the European side. For those who are are geographically uninclined. So today, Bjorn, we're going to delve into one of the most monumental events in human history, the fall of Constantinople, right? So you just talked like the, we, there's a fall of Rome, but this kind of marks the end of like the Roman Empire as we know it, right? It, like this is the end and this kind of moves us into a new portion of human history, at least in the West. Yeah, and actually, it actually identifies a, a timeline stop. You know, this is where we start saying, hey, we're no longer in... The Middle Ages, we are now in what we call the modern era. And so that's kind of the timeline, the fall of Constantinople. Boom. That's where that's kind of what historians identify as transitioning from the Middle Ages. You know, before that, you have the ancient, ancient history, and then you've got Middle Ages, and then you've got modern era. And this is kind of the timeline right here. Boom. 1453, the fall of Constantinople or the conquest of Constantinople. Both of those are mm-hmm. are completely acceptable terms when we're talking about this battle. So one thing that we always like to do for any any battle that we cover is just talk about in the beginning, why is this significant? We've already started to hit some of these things, but let, like this was a big moment in history. So why was it so big? Yeah, first, you know, it, it's the end of the Byzantine Empire. It, it's the end of what was once a major world power for over a thousand years. So this empire had survived invasions from Persians, Arabs, the Crusaders, but it couldn't withstand the might of the Ottomans and it would eventually become absorbed into their empire. Uh, it also marks the rise of the Ottoman Empire. So as one empire falls, the another one comes and takes its place. It's an empire that goes on to become one of the most powerful empires in world history. It's going to span a massive amount of territory from Eastern Europe to the Middle East, North Africa. It's going to be a huge power within the Mediterranean. Their influence will extend far into Asia, Africa, and Europe. Uh, So the fall of Constantinople marks the beginning of an empire that's going to rule for almost 500 years, and they're not going to collapse until the conclusion of World War I. We also see that the fall of the city, here's one that's kind of interesting, it impacts European uh, Renaissance because many of the Byzantine scholars, the individuals who are there in Constantinople, they're going to flee to Italy. Uh, they bring with them a wealth of knowledge, cultural artifacts, and it leads to a spread of another, the Greek scholarship in Europe. So before you have the Romans, remember the Western Romans, early on in their empire, they're going to take over Greece and then they're going to just engorge themselves on everything Greek and and kind of think of them as the more sophisticated, even though the Italians conquered them and thought that they were significant, but it's an interesting relationship between Mm -hmm. the Greco-Romans. And then we're going to see a resurgence of this Greek, this passion for Greek knowledge uh, reassert itself in the Renaissance as a result of the fall of the city. Uh, It's going to have a huge impact on Christianity. 
the Byzantine Empire is this bastion of Orthodox Christianity, and its fall is going to be a huge setback for Orthodox Christians. The, the Muslims are the Ottomans' religion, they're, they're Islamic, and they're going to impose their religion on a lot of these conquered territories. So we're going to see kind of a setback for the Orthodox Christians, and we're going to see uh, an increased amount of influence with the Islamic Muslims in the area. And then another thing here is we're going to see that it is going to impact European t- politics. A uh, major impact on European politics is going to lead to an emergence of the Ottomans as a threat to Europe. Prior to this, they thought that the um, the Ottomans were just someone they didn't need to worry about. And we're going to eventually see the Ottoman Turks moving all the way to Vienna, Austria. And so that's mm. going to be a huge a uh, huge political aspect of the fall of Constantinople. And then one last thing here, Brendan, the the conquest of Constantinople is going to have a huge impact on the course of world history itself, kind of the way that historians themselves, as I had said previously, the way we historians identify and move throughout history. It's going to mark the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the modern era, the Renaissance, the Reformation, scientific revolution and the Enlightenment all are going to be shaped by events that followed the fall of Constantinople. So huge, broad impact, hugely significant battle that really didn't include a whole lot of individuals, If you're, especially if you're looking at the, the individuals who are there to defend the city of Constantinople itself. There's going to be a whole lot of Ottoman Turks present at this battle, but there's not going to be a whole lot of individuals defending the city, but we'll get into that in a little bit. All right, Bjorn, so the conquest of Constantinople took place on the 6th of April, 1453, after a 53-day-long siege. The attacking Ottoman army significantly outnumbered Constantinople's defenders and was commanded by the 21-year-old Sultan Mehmed II, later nicknamed the Conqueror, while the Byzantine army was led by Emperor Constantine XI, Paleologos. Paleologos. That's a a bit of a waffle. No, that's how you say it. I had to to actually look that one up, and the computer pronounced it for me. After conquering the city, Mehmed II made Constantinople the new Ottoman capital, replacing Adrianople. So the conquest of Constantinople and the fall of the Byzantine Empire is a watershed moment in the late Middle East. It marks the effective end of the Roman Empire. Among many modern historians, the fall of Constantinople is considered the end of the medieval period as well. Also interesting to note here, this event can be seen as a turning point in military history. So prior to this battle, cities and castles used ramparts and walls to protect territories. You know, I think we'll go back and talk about a lot of things that happened before the 1400s and castles play a big part in a lot of those discussions. And this is kind of the last time when a castle's like, uh, it, it, we kind of see the end of castles and walls. So the use of gunpowder seen in this battle marks an important change in siege warfare and how armies invade cities. Yeah, and the, we're going to see the use of these bombard cannons on a grand scale and this is truly the reason why we see a transition into the modern era. You know, prior, like you said, castles and walls, that was the best form of defense. Now, siege warfare has to evolve. We can't just see, you know, you can't just build your castle. You can't just build your walls, things that take 20, 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. The walls around Can- Constantinople had been built in series over many, many hundreds Since of years. Since the beginning of the city, right? Yeah, many yeah. hundreds of years. And this is no longer a way in which you can depend on the defense of your city. Tactics have to change. This is why it's so significant. And it was kind of a thing that led to the Byzantines losing the city, right? Because they trusted their walls so much. And Mehmed II had a great plan to overcome them. Oh, man. I'm I'm a huge logistics guy. We're going to get into it. But this guy definitely deserves the title of the conqueror yeah. because of all of his logistical preparations prior to the battle. It gets me all excited. All right, let's talk about the state of the Byzantine Empire here. So Constantinople had been an imperial capital since its consecration in 330 under Roman Emperor Constantine the Great. In the following 11 centuries, the city had been besieged many times, but was captured only once before. The sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade in 1204. The Crusaders established an unstable Latin state in and around Constantinople, while the remainder of the Byzantine Empire splintered into a number of successor states, notably Nicaea, Epirus, and Trebizond. Uh, The Nicaeans reconquered Constantinople from the Latins in 1261, reestablishing the Byzantine Empire under the Paleogos dynasty. For the remainder of the empire's existence, it would be forced to fend off successive attacks by the Latins, Serbs, Bulgarians, and Ottoman Turks. So it like... This thing is like it's it's in the middle of everything, right? But in the middle of Europe, in the middle of Asia, the crossroads of the world. Like, there's people that want this place so bad. <laughs> well, and the most interesting thing to me is that we see the splintering of this Christian religion and and the unity 
against rising Islamic powers. So, you know, the Crusades, 1096, the 1100s, you see Christianity fighting against Islam and Islam's fighting jihad against the Christians. And they're all really unified. You know, yeah, you've got yeah. the Sunni and the Shiite, uh, Shiite Muslims, which have their own different sects, but you've got the Christians, the Orthodox and the Catholics. And the Catholics, yeah. And, and they're all kind of working together against the other guys, right? Yeah. But what we're going to see is after this fourth crusade and the sack of Constantinople, we see some really bad blood between the Latin Catholic church and the Orthodox church, which was based in Constantinople. And that grinding down of the relationship is really going to hurt the individuals in charge of Constantinople and the defense of the city when all of a sudden the Ottoman Turks are at their doorstep. So the other thing we need to talk about here, too, is the time at which this battle takes place, right? So the, the state of Constantinople, just part of the battle, was not good, right? The city had lost half of its population between 1346 and 1349. Uh, that's only three years uh, because of the Black Death, the plague came through. So Constantinople, the, one of the first cities in line to receive the plague from Asia, and uh, it decimates Constantinople, and then would go on to decimate the rest of Europe. Well, and here's a really interesting side note here about the Black Death, Brendan. Back in the day, Europeans didn't like cats. So every time they saw a stray cat, they tried to, you know, dispatch this cat. And so you had all these rats yeah, just running around. Rats? Yeah. <laughs> the cats normally dispatch the rats, but instead yeah. these Europeans who are superstitious would get rid of these stray cats. And then there was no one to take care of the rats. And remember, the bubonic plague, the Black Death is created based off of fleas on rats. And every once in a while, the bacterium that that is in those fleas actually gets mutates to a point where it kills the rats and then the rats all die. And then these fleas need to find someone else to eat blood off of and they go to the next nearest thing. And when cities are just packed with these rats due to the fact that the stray cats have all been killed by Europeans who are superstitious, then many, many people die. And so one would wonder what would happen if they hadn't killed all the cats. Obviously, mm. there would have still been rats. There probably wouldn't have been that many rats. And maybe you would have lost half of your population and half of your military age fighting men. Well, that's a potential idea maybe. as well. <laughs> so they have the plague happen and then economic and territorial problems across the empire further depopulate the city. So by 1453, the city consisted of a series of walled villages separated by vast fields and circled by the 5th century Theodosian walls. By 1450, the empire was exhausted and had shrunk to a few square kilometers outside the city of Constantinople. So empire it is no more. Look at that. 5th century Theodosian walls. So that is a thousand year old wall. Yeah. Now, obviously, they'd had, you know, upgrades and tried to maintain it, but that wall was established a thousand years ago. And now we're going up against modern bombard cannon. All right. Quick aside here on the geography, too. So we kind of talked about this a little bit, but the city of Constantinople today, we call this Istanbul, is built on a peninsula that is triangular in shape where the Bosphorus, which goes, it's the, it goes into the Black Sea, the Golden Horn, which is a large inlet going into Europe, and the Marmara Sea, which is that northeastern part of the Mediterranean. The city had walls protecting the third side of the triangle where the peninsula connects with the rest of Europe. This siege will involve not only land-based siege units, but vessels from both empires' fleet. I would recommend go look at a map of this place because it is extremely important to world history. You just go look at a map and see what this place looks like. Uh, but basically, we're looking at, you know, peninsula, water on three sides, walls on one side that go back into Europe. I got that right, right, Bjorn? Yep, yep. Yeah. So they're also going to have a couple walls, like smaller minor walls that are going to be on the the tips. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a triangle. See, you've got one of the... One of the uh, sides of the triangle is the the land-based Theodosian walls, and then you've got the two other portions of the triangle, kind of like equilateral triangles that are based off of water, uh, and water's bordering them. And so the naval vessels are going to have to protect those. There's also a harbor that is going to be there on the north side of this triangle, and they're actually going to drive a chain across that to prevent any Ottoman vessels from being able mm -hmm. to go into the harbor. So that's going to be a huge defensive aspect for the individuals in Constantinople. They're going to be able to prevent Turk vessels from getting in. When Mehmed II succeeded his father in 1451, he was just 19 years old. European nations believe that the young Ottoman ruler would not seriously challenge Christian domination of the Balkans. Interestingly, Europe celebrated Mehmed coming to the throne and hoped his inexperience would lead the Ottomans astray. This calculation was boosted by Mehmed's 
friendly overtures to the European envoys at his new court. But actions speak louder than words. By early 1452, work began on the construction of a second fortress on the European side of the Bosphorus, several miles north of Constantinople. The new fortress sat directly across the strait from another fortress, which gave the Ottomans complete control of all sea traffic on the Bosphorus. The new fortress was nicknamed Baugaukitsan, which means straight blocker or throat cutter. Uh, in October 1452, Mehmed ordered Turakan Beg, a prominent Ottoman general, to station a large garrison force in the Peloponnese to block Thomas and Demetrios, despots in southern Greece, from providing aid to their brother Constantine XI during the impending siege of Constantinople. Yeah, so you've got a fortress being built on the European side. So remember, the Bosphorus is just kind of a river. It's a wide river that goes between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, connecting the Black Sea and all the wealth of, of Asia in to the Mediterranean. So the Bosphorus at, at some point is no longer than, is no more than a mile uh, wide. So you've got two forts, one on either side, and that's absolutely stationed there in order to direct and, and prevent trade or unwanted trade from making it into the Black Sea or out of the Black Sea. So now the Ottomans are definitely threatening Constantinople's position, but then also they're moving south into the into the southern portions of the Balkans. So you've got Constantinople on the north, they're Ottomans, and on the south, they're Ottomans. So this is really quickly going to identify to uh, Constantine the Eleventh, who remembers the leader, the emperor of Constantinople, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. He is going to quickly realize this threat, and you know. Good on him. He's going to recognize this threat. He just doesn't have a whole lot of options mm -hmm. in front of him. So here's what I, this is really imp impressive to me. I'm the logistics guy. I really like this stuff. The Ottomans are going to really prepare carefully. They're going to send men to prepare the roads from, remember, Adrianople is the, the capital of the Ottoman Empire at this time. They'll later change it to Constantinople, but they're actually going to send men to fix up the roads. They look at these roads between Adrianople and Constantinople and they say, hey, the roads are insufficient to cope with the size of these massive cannons. So before we invade, we need to be prepared to move these cannons. And to do so, we have to improve our roads. They're going to send over 50 carpenters and more than 200 artisans to strengthen the roads in any area that's necessary, especially any bridges. They're going to shore up those bridges because these bombard cannons are huge. I think one thing that we need to understand about Mehmed II is he is very crafty. He's cunning. He plays statecraft extremely well. And you can kind of see it here, like the Europeans think he's weak, but he's really kind of like ginning up support and he's destroying support for the for Constantine, right? Like, oh, the other European nations don't need to support the, the Byzantine Empire because it's just this, you know, this, this young kid. But he is like, he's being very crafty here and he, like setting himself up perfectly to take Constantinople. Now, one of the things that, that I like to think of is you've got Mehmed here and he's playing chess. Yeah. You know, he's he's thinking a couple moves ahead of his opponent. He understands that the city has not been conquered outright in three or 300 years and its entire 1000 year existence. It's only ever been conquered one time. And that was through some nefarious deeds by individuals who they thought were allies. So he's thinking ahead. He's playing the game of chess. And the sad part about it is that Constantine and the Byzantines, they're kind of playing checkers here. Constantine XI knew something was up. And so he turns to his Western European allies for support. But the price of centuries of war between the Eastern and Western churches had to be paid. Since the mutual excommunications of 1054, the Pope in Rome was committed to establishing unity with the Eastern Church. In the years between, there were honest attempts by the Byzantine leaders to bridge a gap between Latin and Orthodox churches to no avail. Latent ethnic hatred between the Greeks and Italians stemming from the events of the massacre of the Latins in 1182 by the Greeks and the sack of Constantinople in 1204 by the Latins played a significant role. Ultimately, the attempted union between East and West failed. Constantine is not getting any support from his closest geographic friends, right, from Italy. Like there's, there's no support to be had. Well, and to make matters worse is that um, as we see Mehmed moving in and we just see a more and more desperate uh, Constantine and his individuals. So they're actually going to see, um, you know, the straight blocker, that fortress is going to be almost completed. The threat of the Ottomans becomes imminent. Constantine's going to write to the Pope. He's going to promise him. He's going to say, Hey, uh, we're going to, we're going to unite the Eastern and Western churches. So remember, uh, the Pope in Rome is the leader of the Catholic church. You've got the auto, the Orthodox Christians are based out of 
Constantinople. Mm -hmm. And so here you've got Constantine so concerned about the state of his empire that he's writing to the Pope promising, saying, hey, we are going to unify the Eastern and Western church. Uh, He even has his imperial court provide a, you know, albeit half-hearted valid declaration uh, on the 12th of December in 1452. So they are going to agree. His imperial court will agree to this union should they have help from the West. But, you know, Pope Nicholas V doesn't have the influence that he thought he had. You know, he's going to he's going to try and rally the Western kings and princes. But here's the deal. Most of the nations in Europe at this point in time, they're worried about the pope gaining more control. Well, and then there's a couple other instances of indiv- of people who are not really in position to help out. Brendan, what are the, some of those what are some of those countries and how yeah. how are they no longer capable of providing assistance to to the Byzantine? To make matters worse here, the Hundred Years' War between France and England, along with the Reconquista in Spain, fighting within the Holy Roman Empire, had significantly drained the resources of these Western rulers. They, like Western Europe's basically been at war uh, almost constantly for the last hundred or so years. Uh, so you've got England and France fighting each other for, you know, now it's more than, they call it the Hundred Years' War. It's actually a series of wars that took place over a hundred years. Uh, but then you've got the Spanish are going to be trying to reconquer uh, the Moorish land in southern Spain. So they're going to spend a long, considerable amount of time trying to drive out the Moors mm-hmm. in Spain themselves. And then you've got this little petty infighting between the Holy Roman Empire and all the something like 300 independent states that identified themselves as a part of the Holy Roman Empire. It's nearly impossible to get any sort of agreement or uh, correlated effort with the Holy Roman Empire. It's, it's basically at this point in time, it's a title that is provided to somebody and it's really not worth a whole lot. Yeah. And so like, there's no political capital or will to want to defend the Byzantine Empire because all it is is a city now. Uh, there's no hope of reconquering the Holy Lands, right? So now it's like, how do we t- take care of ourselves? So we, sorry, Byzantines, we got our own thing to deal with here. So they did get some aid though. So some aid did arrive mostly from city states in Northern Italy, such as Genoa and Venice. The bottom line here is that Western contribution was not adequate to counterbalance the Ottomans. And we do see some folks from the West coming in here to try to help the city on their own account. So the first one is Cardinal Isidore, funded by the Pope. He arrived in 1452 with 200 archers. Giovanni Giustiniani. <laughs> Giustiniani. Yeah, I think it's Good. I think it's Giustiniani. Giovanni Giustiniani, an accomplished soldier from Genoa, arrived in January 1453 with 400 men from Genoa and 300 men from the Genoese Chios. Uh, As a specialist in defending walled cities, Giustiniani was immediately given the overall command of the defense of the land walls by the emperor. So, hey, you have a ton of experience. I'm just going to make you the leading general, even though you're like a a guest here. Yeah, but under like take note. We got the guy from the Pope is coming with 200 dudes. Giustiani is coming with 300 men and another 400 men. So he's got 700. There's 900 dudes right there. Like yeah. this is, this That's is, many. this is peanuts here. Uh, captains of the Venetian ships that had happened to be present in the Golden Heart offered their services to the emperor. Uh, hey, we're already here. So I guess we're going to help. Although <laughs> Now they did actually have a caveat on that. So the captains of these Venetian ships, they said, Hey, we will help you out. As long as Venice doesn't have a problem with that. Mm. So they did actually put a little caveat and say, hey, if our people have a problem with it, then we won't help out. But they are going to actually help. And it's going to be a huge, uh, they're going to provide a huge assistance when this Ottoman fleet shows up, because that's basically all that's holding that position are these these vessels. You can't get many more ships abreast in that strait. It's, uh, yeah, like you said, it's pretty narrow in there. So um Pope Nicholas also sent three ships laden with provisions, uh, which set sail uh, near the end of March to help, you know, give some food to the people of uh, Constantinople. The Venetian Senate decided upon sending a fleet in February 1453, but the fleet's departure was delayed until April, which was too late to assist. Seven Italian ships with around 700 men, despite having sworn to defend Constantinople, slipped out of the capital the moment Giustiniani arrived. Are those the same ships we just talked about? Uh, they're not entirely. There's some more ships okay. that were there, yeah. but definitely uh, a real blow to your morale when you see 700 men and seven ships sneaking out. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do. But at the same time, Constantine is going to try and appease the Sultan, Mehmet, by providing him gifts like, hey, don't hurt me. I'm just this little thing. Here's some gifts. And uh, Mehmet's going to execute 
the ambassadors that the emperor said. So that doesn't bode well yeah. for you and your empire. I think Mehmed said his uh, said the message here with that. Let's talk about these restored walls of Constantinople. So we have the Theodosian walls, but I think, you know, they are not going to protect against a seaward assault here. So a chain was placed at the mouth of the harbor across the Golden Horn in defense against a possible naval attack. The chain floated on logs and was strong enough to prevent any Turkish ship from entering. Now, so what been... is this chain? Like, is it just, uh, I'm imagining the scene from Game of Thrones uh, and they have the big chain across and it's preventing ships from going in. Is that basically all it is? Yeah, that is that is quite literally all that it is. You can actually- I bet you it. George R. R. Martin got the idea for that chain at King's Landing from here. You know, he oh, might have. The, so think of it, the links are about the exact same size as your from your elbow to your fist. So you can actually see today oh, they actually have uh, a bit oh, of the chain. Of in my elbow to my fist? Yeah, so like if you were to- <laughs> From your elbow to your fist, it's about, you know, a foot and a half, foot and a half to two feet long, depending on how long your arms are, I guess. Um, But the links aren't very big. Well, at the same time, things, they've used chains in history to protect harbors. But when you get a really rough sea, then a lot of these chains are going to break and that's going to be a problem. So, I mean, even during the American Civil War, you're going to see a chain that's going to be sent across the Mississippi River, but the flow of the river was too big and it's actually going to crack and break the chain which makes it worthless. And that doesn't stop a whole lot of ships when the force of the waves plus any ships that might be running into it are going to uh, break it. And so this one's actually- A chain is not a good chain. Yeah, this one's actually going to hold and it's actually (laughs) quite impressive because these Ottoman ships are not going to be able to enter via that portion of the battlefield into the harbor. All right, so a strategy here employed by the Byzantines was to repair and fortify the land wall, the Theodosian walls that we've mentioned. So the land fortifications consisted of 60-foot-wide moats uh, fronting inner and outer crenellated walls, so rectangular gaps in the walls from which uh, you could shoot uh, arrows and other projectiles. Uh, Set of the towers about every 180 feet. So they're making some upgrades to their walls in, in preparation for the upcoming. Yeah, and they've been doing this for a while now. As you know, as much as Mehmed's been preparing his fortresses and moving his men into the south and he's been making moves towards conquering the city the city's been doing what they can to rebuild their walls interesting note here those crenellated walls that's just a fancy way of saying it's not just a wall with a straight top it's the it's the ones when you think in your mind of what a castle looks like and they've got the rectangular blocks and then it's you know up and then there's a spot where you can look over and then there's another spot to protect you Uh, it's not just straight across it's kind of hard to explain via audio i guess you might need to take a picture of it google crenellated walls in order to see what it looks like but it's your standard castle wall type of a type of a defense all right bjorn let's talk about the strength of both of these forces so the army defending Constantinople was incredibly small, totaling about 7,000 men, 2,000 of which weren't from Constantinople. And so at the onset of the siege, probably fewer than 50,000 people were living within the walls, including the refugees from the surrounding area. So like that is that is not a lot of people here. Uh, you know, so we're nice. talking about like, you know, the ancient Roman Empire is basically down to 7,000 fighting men. Well, and you can take a look at some of the measurements of these, the walls and the perimeter. You've got like four and a half kilometers by four and a half kilometers by four and a half kilometers, something like that. Mm. And that equates to one or two men every couple of meters if everyone's on the line. They're not going to be basically this fortress is not going to be fully manned in any way, shape or form. I wonder how many men would have taken to fully occupy the wall. A hell of a lot more than that. A whole heck of a lot more than 7,000. So Turkish commander... Dorgano, who was in Constantinople working for uh, the emperor, was also guarding one of the quarters of the city on the seaward side with the Turks in his pay. These Turks kept loyal to the emperor and perished in the ensuing battle. So that's interesting that there are Turks within Constantinople that are fighting for the Byzantine. Well, and you're going to also see on the on the flip side of it, you're going to see Christian Serbs fighting with mm. Mehmed and the and the. Uh, Muslim. So it's going to be interesting to say the least of how these loyalties are going to play out. And the fact that his men actually stayed and fought the entire time, that's actually really impressive and says a lot to their loyalty. Money talks, I guess. I'm I'm assuming there's some sort of monetary compensation. Yeah, I don't know, but I mean, money doesn't talk very well when you're dead. That, that's a good point. <laughs> All right. So the defending army's Genoese Corps were well-trained and equipped while the rest of the army consisted of small numbers of well-trained soldiers, armed civilians, sailors, and volunteer forces from foreign communities, and finally, monks. So we're like, 
like when you're talking about like you know modern army like when it gets down to the chaplain like you are in, in <laughs> bad shape when our, when, our monks, fighting. when our monks are fighting that's not yeah. good the garrison used a few small caliber artillery pieces, which in the end proved ineffective. Uh, and then the rest of the citizens repaired walls, stood guard and observation posts, collected and distributed food provisions, and collected gold and silver objects from churches to melt down at the coins to pay the foreign soldiers. So they're like, they're emptying the accounts. They're doing everything. Like, this is the this is the last stand of the empire, right? So they're doing everything they can to try to withstand the siege. Well, and remember, the siege is going to be 53 days. So... You've got to pay these dudes. If you're not paying them, they're going to find a way out. And so that's going to be expensive. All right. So the Ottomans had a way larger uh, recent studies and Ottoman archival data state that there were some 50 to 80,000 Ottoman soldiers, five to 10,000 Janissaries who are the elite Ottoman forces. Bjorn, can you just give us like a quick rundown of like who the Janissaries are? Yeah. So the Janissaries, they're actually like when the Ottoman Turks would conquer new territory, and let's just say it was a, a Christian organization or Christian state previously that they had conquered, they would go to those individuals and they would essentially require them to provide them with their sons. And so they would take these young kids and they would uh, enslave them, kind of enslave them. They were actually quite elite and well taken care of, but they were technically slaves. They'd enslave them, they would convert them to Islam, and they would raise them up as an elite military force. Mm. So, you know, there, it's the beginning of the Game of Thrones. You've got that slave army at the yeah. beginning of the show. This is what the Janissaries are. You've, they're going to originate as an incredibly strong force, a terrifying force, uh, and they're going to have a lot of pride. They're going to have a lot of loyalty. But as with any major, major organization that a lot of people want to be a part of, they're actually going to lose some of their standards as higher level elite individuals who maybe aren't up to snuff are going to want to use their influence to become a part of the Janissaries. A high influential individual is going to want his son to be a Janissary. And it's kind of going to dilute the potency of this elite fighting force for the Ottomans. But in the beginning here at 1453, these Janissaries, they are the elite special forces. They're like the Persian um, the immortals. immortals. They're yeah. like Delta Force for us. You know, they're they're great. These guys are the best of the best and the most trained, well-equipped individuals. By the time of the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries are going to be nothing but a figurehead. Mm -hmm. But right now, these dudes, they know business. Real deal. All right, so the Ottomans also bring 70 cannon, thousands of Christian soldiers, notably 1,500 Serbian cavalry, and Durat Brankovic. Forgive yep. me for saying <laughs> I, no, I think that was close, but... I think it was uh, really good. Uh, Durat Brankovic. Yeah. Uh, he was forced to supply as part of his obligation to the Ottoman Sultan. So uh, like you talked about, so there's some Serbian uh, military here that were uh, must have had some sort of agreement with the with the Ottomans here. So interesting side note here, uh, Brankovic had supplied the money for the reconstruction of the walls. Of so he's so, going to destroy the walls that he helped build. Or yeah, so this dude, this dude's donating funds to help rebuild the walls of Constantinople. And then now he's on the Ottoman Turks side fulfilling an obligation that he has to the Turks in destroying these walls that he just helped to build. At the time, witnesses tended to exaggerate with forces. We're gonna, we say this basically every episode. The exaggeration was 160 to 300,000 men. Modern estimates between 100 and 130,000 Ottomans, which is still way more than what uh, the Byzantines have. Well, you got 7,000 Byzantine troops. And at the top number, that's almost 20 to 1. At yeah. the lowest of the low number, it's more than two to one or 10 to one. It's more than 10 to one at the bottom number and it's 20 to one at the highest. This is not, this doesn't appear at first glance to be an even game. I, I think the wall, like the Theodosian walls that we talked about definitely helped to even odds a little bit, but it's not going to, it's not going to cover the whole thing, especially with what Mehmet's going to bring to them. Right. Like those 70 cannons are... They're, they're scary. So, all right. So Mehmed also built a fleet, crewed partially by Spanish sailors from Gallipoli to besiege a city from the sea. Modern estimates predict a fleet strength of 110 ships, comprising 70 large galleys, five ordinary galleys, 10 small galleys, 25 large rowing boats, and another 75 horse train. And another 75 horse train. That's a lot of ships. And we're talking about like the, the Byzantines are worried that seven Italian ships left. Yeah, but here's the thing though. In the 1400s into the 1500s, there are going to be two different styles of naval vessels that are going to be competing with each other for the future of what naval warfare looks like. And the Ottoman Turks are kind of going to get, they're going to get stuck in this galley idea when mm -hmm. 
the Venetians, the Italian uh, merchant city states are actually going to be using, um, they're not going to be using galleys. They're going to actually be using a different type of ship that is much better capable of moving. Uh, they're going to have a lot more cannon on board. And those are actually, there's going to be a battle. We'll probably end up having to discuss it in the future, but there's a battle between two navies. They're both different styles and the galley is basically going to end its, its oh, reign of terror. Uh, and so these, these Ottoman There's ships, a lot of ships, but they're probably not as yeah, optimized as what a they lot of great there. ships, yeah. a lot of ships here, but they're not, they're not anything compared to what the Venetians and the Gian oceans are bringing to the game. But that being said, 110 ships is a lot of ships. So before this battle, it was known that the Ottomans had the ability to cast medium sized cannon. But the range of some of these pieces, uh, they were able to field far surpassed the defenders' expectations. The Ottomans deployed a number of cannon anywhere from 12 to 62. We also said 70. So, but it's it's a large number, a lot more cannon than the uh, Byzantines have. Most cannons were made by the Turks, but they had one big one. They had a big boy. Uh, this one was made by a Hungarian named Orban Hiss. Uh, it was a t- beyond 27 feet long, and it was named the Basilica. And it was able to th- hurl a 600-pound stone ball over a mile. That was a big cannonball, 600 pounds. And and throwing it a mile. A mile. Like that's, a, that's a long shot for a cannon in the Civil War. Orban, the Hungarian cannon maker, tried to sell his services to the Byzantines, but they were unable to secure the funds needed to hire him. So Orban left Constantinople and approached Mehmed II, claiming that his weapon could blast the walls of Babylon. That's a good line. And it looks like it sold him some cannon. Oh yeah, super good line. Given abundant funds and materials, the Hungarian engineer built the gun within three months. It had several drawbacks. It took three hours to reload. Cannonballs <laughs> were in very short supply. I can't imagine that there's a lot of 600-pound cannonballs sitting on warehouse, you know, yeah, I don't even know how floors you, anywhere. I don't even know how you find a 600-pound cannonball. Like, I guess you, you got to make it, but how do you make that? And the cannon is said to have collapsed under its own recoil after six. Yeah. Yeah, I, you make the gun, but yeah, you got to have ammunition for it. And trying to haul 600-pound cannonballs, like even like get them onto the horse cart. Well, moving your, moving your 27 foot long cannon, like, come on, oh, that's insane. It's going to take 60 oxen to pull that thing. Having previously established a large foundry about 150 miles away, Mehmed now had to undertake the painstaking process of transporting his massive artillery pieces. In preparation for the final assault, Mehmed had an artillery train of 70 large pieces dragged from his headquarters, in addition to the bombards cast on the spot. The train included Orban's enormous cannon, which was said to have been dragged by a crew of 60 ox and 400 men for one, for one cannon. That eventually broke. Like, oh man. There was also another lar- large bombard independently built by Turkish engineer Saruka that was also used in the battle. But now, so, the, why'd they build the foundry so far away from the battle? They yeah, that, that seems like a mistake, number one. But hey, <laughs> they had really nice reinforced roads, all right? So they right. could they could haul it. But for everyone who's listening, these bombard cannons, they're not they're not mounted on anything. So these cannons, they're, they're basically built on a stand and it, there's no room for recoil. So all the cannons that we think about have wheels, the gun fires, the recoil pushes it back and the wheels spin, and then they have to roll it back into place. This thing doesn't have that. This is basically a big 27 foot cannon barrel placed almost on the ground, but kind of on a stand of wood of wooden ties that they put together. This thing does not move, and it doesn't take recoil well. So, I mean, are we just talking basically like one or two shots is all these things get? Because I'm assuming with the, without the cannon be able to recoil, like all that force going into it can't be good for it. Well, and they're going to have, I mean, obviously it's 1453, so their manufacturing capabilities are not going to be up to snuff with anything in the industrial age. But you're going to see wear and tear. These things are going to have cracks in them. They're going to explode. You're going to have casualties. But the question is, are you going to have that before you have the walls come crumbling down? That's the question. So Mehmed planned to attack the Theodosian walls. The intricate series of walls and ditches protected Constantinople from an attack from the west and the only part of the city not surrounded by water. His army encamped outside the city on 2 April, 1450, the Monday after. It was nice that he waited. Oh, yeah. Super nice of him. Considerate of him to wait. (laughs) Thanks, Mehmed. Uh, So the bulk of the Ottoman army was encamped south of the Golden Horn. The regular European troops stretched out along the entire length of the walls were commanded by Karasha Pasha. The regular troops from Manitoya under Ishak Pasha were stationed south of the Lycus, small river that splits the peninsula, down to the Sea of Marmara. 
Mehmed himself erected his red and gold tent in the middle of the battlefield, where the guns and the elite Janissary regiments were positioned. The Bashi Bazooks, uh, irregular troops untrained means crazy head, uh, were spread out behind the front lines. Other troops under Zagan Pasha were employed north of the Golden Horn. Communication was maintained by a road that had been destroyed over the marshy head of the horn. So those Bashi Bazooks, uh, I thought that was really funny when I was when I was doing some research on them. It means, like I, like you said, crazy head. So these dudes, they're untrained, they're undisciplined, they have no real idea what they're doing in war, and really the only reason they're there, and they're traditionally always within Ottoman armies, but these guys are there. It's like because, a psychological thing? Well, they're not so much psychological thing. They're there for the loot. They're all like, yeah, we're here, uh, we're going to help out, and we'd love to take whatever we can in the event of this, this thing going off. So uh, they're nuts, they're ridiculous and untrained. So think of like the most, you know, I don't know, you've got guys with torches and pitchforks all the way to guys with swords and spears. They're, mm. they're all over the place. Another thing to note here, the Ottomans were experts in laying siege. They knew that in order to prevent diseases, they had to burn corpses, sanitarily dispose of excrement, and carefully scrutinize their sources. Of- like, those are things that you don't really think about, but like kill armies. You, you get dysentery or some sort of disease rampant through your camp, you're, you're screwed. Well, take a look at this. It's 1453, and the Turks know this already. Go to the Crimean War, which are going to take place 400 years later, and the majority of casualties during the Crimean War are going to be from diseases, from Mm. poor sanitary conditions, from the inability to treat wounds. That's going to be the majority of the casualties in that entire war. And that's 400 years after the Ottomans had figured this out. All right, let's transition here to talk about the disposition and tactics of the Byzantines. So the city had about 12 and a half miles of wall, land walls, three and a half miles, sea walls along the Golden Horn, about four and a half miles, sea walls along the Sea of Marmara, another four and a half miles. One of the strongest sets of fortified walls in existence. The walls had recently been repaired and were in fairly good shape, giving the defenders sufficient reason to believe that they could hold out until the help from the West arrived. In addition, the defenders were relatively well equipped with a fleet of 26 ships, five from Genoa, five from Venice, three from Venetian Crete, one from Ancona, one from Aragon, one from France, and about 10 from the Empire itself. So I just did some really quick math here. 12 and a half miles of walls divided by 7,000 soldiers. That's one soldier every 10 feet of wall. And those soldiers aren't going to be up the whole time. Right. There you go. You have to have your rest work plan. Yeah, that's exactly right. I guess like during like when the siege is actually happening, like the contact, maybe all all 7,000 get on the line. But for the most, like you're probably talking about like one dude every, every 20 feet. That's not enough people. That's not enough people. <laughs> on 5 April, the Sultan himself arrived with his last troops, and the defenders took up their position. As Byzantine numbers were insufficient to occupy the walls in their entirety, it had been decided that only the outer walls would be guarded. Constantine and his Greek troops guarded Mesotetian, the middle section of the land walls, where they were crossed by the river Lycus. The section was considered the weakest spot in the walls, and an attack was feared here the most. So Giussiani was stationed to the north of the emperor at the Cherizan Gate, Later during the siege, he was shifted to the Mesotetian to join Constantine, leaving the charge to the Bashiardi brothers. Oh, man. These Italian names, man. We better not <laughs> ever pick an Italian <laughs> at the end of the future. <laughs> All right. So the sea walls were guarded more sparsely. A makeshift defense force of Greek monks and Prince Orhan at the harbor. Man, don't put your Greek monks out in the front. Why are they the first people we talked about there? <laughs> Genoese and Catalan troops were stationed at the Great Palace. Cardinal Isidore of Kiev guarded the tip of the peninsula near the boom. Finally, the sea walls at the southern shore of the Golden Horn were defended by Venetian and Genoese sailors under Gabriel Trevisano. All right. So two tactical reserves were kept behind in the city, one in the Petra district just behind the land walls and one near the Church of the Holy Apostles under the command of Lucas Notaras and Nisiphorus Peliolo. Peleo- that must be a like a son or a nephew, right, of the emperor? Yeah, it's a, it's a relative. Yeah. Uh, the Venetian Alvisio Dito commanded the ships in the harbor. Although the Byzantines also had cannon, the weapons were much smaller than those of the Ottomans, and the recoil tended to damage their own wall. See, that's the thing. You need wheels. You got to have wheels on you gotta your have cannons. Wheels. And we've had wheels forever by this point. Oh, yeah. The wheels in the cannon. Come well, on. They can't figure this out. So according to historian... Actually, Bjorn, how about you take this next? So according to historian David Nicole... Uh, despite many odds, the the idea that Constantinople was inevitably doomed is completely incorrect. Uh, the situation is not as one sided as a simple glance at the map might suggest. You know, you look at it and you say, "Well, there's seven thousand 
uh, individuals fighting for Constantinople, and there are 70,000 Turks. It's not the same. Uh, It's also been claimed that Constantinople at the time was the best defended city in Europe. So what we're saying here is although one would look at this and say, well, this doesn't seem like a significant battle at all. This doesn't seem like a big deal. It seemed like one dude came in with 10 to 20 times as many men as the other one did, and he just walked all over it. That's not going to be the case. Uh, We're going to talk about that later, though. I mean, these walls are formidable, and the repairs that they did to them are formidable. And it's in like the best spot to have a fortress, right? So there's a, like, yeah, Mehmed had to bring everything he had to this fight to be successful. And I mean, he he does and he will, but it wasn't it wasn't a foregone conclusion that the Ottomans were going to win here. Yeah, he didn't just show up and they won. It's not going to happen. All right, everyone, that's going to conclude today's episode of the lead up into the fall of Constantinople. So thank you so much for listening. Be sure you hit that subscribe button so that uh, two weeks from now, you get the next episode where we talk about the siege and the conquest of Constantinople. Bjorn, thanks again for another good one. Everyone, we'll catch you later. MMG out.